Greetings from Bethel Memorial Baptist Church. It is Mother's Day. and We are happy to gather together today and celebrate uh, the relationships that we have in life, beginning with our moms. And I need to be honest, I was going to not really focus on Mother's Day today because I'm in the book of Galatians and I was going to preach Galatians chapter two, which deals with the relationship of Paul and the other apostles. And I thought, that's a good thing. I'll do a quick introduction related to moms and honor them for a second. And then I'll get on to what I want to preach. Well, something happened this week and it's a tremendous challenge uh, to me. I signed up a couple of weeks ago for a conference that um, just is, it's, it's about sexuality. It's an Equip Leader Summit a sexuality with the gospel focus. We have to deal with relationships. We have to deal with the, the, the challenges of this world because we've so, the world has so corrupted what relationships should be, starting with gender identity and, and going forward. The fact is God created us and sin has marred that creation, but, but we know that God has a, a redemptive plan for us. So I could have just opened up with a verse that I had in my devotions this morning, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 7, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And I would have talked about the choice of love uh, to, to bear with one another, to bear others' burdens with them, or sometimes to bear them as a burden because of the struggles that they're going. They seem to, to be a, a burden for us, but we bear them up as an object of love, God's love and the love he calls us to have for them. Because of uh, that commitment, or to fulfill that commitment, we need to believe. We need to believe not in our ability, not in their goodness, but in God's power, God's love, God's desire to do something in us that can flow out to other people. So we can bear all things and believe all things because of who God is. And then when we do that, then we can find the hope that allows us to endure. Do you have a hope of enduring? Not without God, I don't. So I could have challenged that verse and said, happy Mother's Day, we love you, and then moved on. But something else happened this week. I, I, well, I, the, the, the National Day of Prayer. Um, and I read a headline that said, for the first time, a president made a proclamation on the National Day of Prayer and did not mention God. Now, that's designed to upset us. Now, to be fair, he did say in the year of our Lord at the end of the proclamation, um, and he also mentioned God in his speech before he uh, presented that proclamation. But there are some things in the, in the proclamation that I, I just want to touch on briefly. It says, Americans of faith can call upon the power of prayer to provide hope and uplift us. Now, Christians talk about the power of prayer, but it's in the context of knowing the power of God. Because there's, no in in, there's no power in prayer in and of itself. Because you could pray to a an idol, you could pray to something, you could be looking to something not God, and there's no power there. And, and whether people understand that or not, we know that. So when, when the president says the power of prayer, he misses the point. It's through prayer that we lay hold of the power of God. Now, God doesn't always do what we ask him to do, but he gives us the power to endure and, and continue to follow and seek to do the right thing, even if he doesn't grant the requests that we have. There was another quote that, that really got me. He quoted the late John Lewis, and he said, nothing can stop the power of a committed and determined people to make a difference in our society. Why? Because human beings are the most dynamic link to the divine on this planet. Now, that sounds like we're trusting in our ability. That sounds like we are the, our God in this world. Uh, the fact that God is very much involved in our world. Yes, we represent him. Yes, we, he flows through us, but it's not dependent upon us. It's always dependent upon God. So as I went through this conference and then thought about the National Day of Prayer, I thought we need to take time and, and set aside time to um, focus on our relationships, particularly on Mother's Day, to, to let people know the importance of relationships in this world. Now there's a verse that I included on a little bookmark we printed out for our, our ladies today. Um, Leviticus 19.3, I don't really like going to Leviticus too often. Uh, it's hard to find the verses that I just, 
kind of said, well, that's under the law. What do I do with that? But this is a great verse. Every one of you shall revere his mother and his father, and you shall keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Now think about that. Think about all the stories you hear about the fights that Jesus had with the religious leaders about the Sabbath. The Sabbath is so important. I was in Israel. The Sabbath laws still exist. Not everybody follows them, but the one story we heard was on there are certain Sabbath elevators that stop at every floor so you don't have to work to push the button. That's just how Sabbath was ingrained uh, that in, in, their, in their lives. And it's thought it was so important. Well, in this verse, what comes first? Revering your mother and your father. That's encouraging. If you don't learn to show love in the first relationship that you experience, you are not going to be close followers of God. You are not going to be able to reflect the image of God that he has created in you. We need to know that relationships are more important. And that's why Jesus always said, I love people, not just the Sabbath. It's not that he didn't want to respect the Sabbath, but there were people who had a need and he was going to take care of those needs. So I just thought that was a, a great verse. Again, I could have just jumped off that verse and, and said, okay, now let's look at Galatians 2. But really where I want to go today is the, the, the title of this message is Bright Hope in Our Relationships. And I, my proposition is hope in our relationships can be found in the first family. And I'm not talking about the presidential family. I'm talking about the first family, Adam and Eve and their children. So we're going to look at that today. It's so important. We look to see the foundations of our society, and it could help us make sense of all the confusion that we see about sexuality in our world today. Let's, let me open an word of prayer. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the many truths of your word and one day we need to talk about the creation. Another day we need to talk about the coming of the Lord. Another day we need to talk about salvation. We, we need to talk about all these things. But Lord, our relationships are really part of the greatest commandments that we are to love you and to love one another. So I pray that you would bless us in this time of looking to your word to think of how we can better obey the, the second commandment. That out of a love for you, uh, we then love one another. Help us to see what you will do in our lives. Lord, I pray that you'll have mercy on me, a sinner. I know how often I stumble and fail in putting others first and, and bearing with one another and believing and hoping and enduring. Um, I, I thank you that you have the power to, to pick me up in, in mercy and grace and, and cause me to move on. Bless us now as we look into your word. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hope in our relationships can be found in the first family. The first thing I see in the first family is the blessing of relationships. I'm going to read, just going to skim through some verses in Genesis 1 through 2, which is the creation story. And let's just get some foundational principles in about relationships. First of all, our creator exists in eternal relationship. Verse 26 of Genesis 1 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. The creator exists in an eternal relationship. We call it the Trinity. There are three persons, all being God, and one in essence, but distinct in person. They each have their own mind, uh, emotions, and will. That's what we kind of think about when we think about what person, what a person is, a personality is. And, and yet it's completely unified in the one essence of God. Now, there are those today that are talking about the oneness view of God, that the God is just, um, uh, he's one God, and he has different faces at different times. Right now, it's the office of son that is most focused on. And it, it just, it don't even understand it. it. It really grows out of an old belief called modality, um, where the, the God manifested himself differently. There was one God, and he manifested himself as father in creation, the son in redemption, and now the spirit in action. I don't know why we argue about such things. God is hard to express. God is hard to understand. But I love the fact that there are three persons in one essence, and there's an eternal relationship. God, who was he speaking to? And he said, let us. He wasn't speaking to Adam. He was speaking to himself. And, and, and the God had determined to, to, to create so they could, could expand their relationship, not just with 
one another, but with the, of the, their creation. So our creator exists in eternal relationship. So relationships are going to be important. The next thing we see in verse 27 uh, of, of chapter one. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Our creator made male and female in his image. Men are not more important than women. Women are not poor, more important than male. Together, we reflect the image of God. Obviously, with sin, it's now marred, but that was the intention. So I just, again, we need to remember to pray for all those people that have what we call gender issues, that they, they look at their body and they say, I don't feel this way. I'm going to be something else. Um, they have the freedom in this world to do that. We shouldn't focus so much on stopping them as much as understanding them to see how we can help and help other people that might be having that struggle. Um, God made male and female, and he made us both um, in his image. Now, jumping over to chapter uh, 2, verse 18, it says, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. The Lord God said that. Now, our creator recognizes our need for relationship and not just a relationship with him because Adam could have had that, but he wanted to, to give Adam a relationship with one of his own kind. Do you remember the story? He brought all the animals and there was no suitable helper found in the animal kingdom. And so he created Eve uh, to be a helper for him. Now that idea of helper, again, it's a mutual help and encouragement. The, the plan was for a man and a wife to be unified and together, we talk about the headship of men, and that's true because ultimately God's going to hold the man responsible for the relationship, but the woman is just as important, and they need to, to be there mutually for one another. God recognizes our need for relationship. Even if you're single, you need to know there are people that you have to surround yourself with. You have to learn to relate to people. You can't be an island of, in a, of yourself. And then going on to verse 21 through 25, of chapter two. So the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took out one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is at, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Think about this. Our creator defines marriage. Not a popular view today. We want to rewrite the rules of marriage. We didn't invent marriage. We didn't give marriage. God gave marriage to, the, to his creation. And he's the one who defines that it's between a man and a woman. That's, that's an ideal that we hold up. Do marriages fail? Yes. Do people not want to be attracted to the same, uh, to the opposite sex? That is so clear in our society today. But we need to go back to what the Creator defined marriage as, and we need to hold off to that. And again, if you're not married, if you've been widowed, if you've been divorced, if you've never been married, God has given the gift of marriage to the world, but it's not a gift given to all. Don't let that hold you back. One of the things that came out in the conference is, what is our eternal relationship in heaven going to be? What's the relationship, what are relationships going to look like in heaven? We are all sons and daughters of our heavenly father. That makes us all brothers and sisters with one another. Think about that for a second, that my children will be my sisters. Um, my mom will be my sister, my dad, my grandparents, brother and sister, all generations. We, we won't have marriage relationships in heaven. We will all be part of one family, all brothers and sisters. That's kind of the high ideal that we're heading for, the relationships that are so important. We'll have one with God. Sometimes I think I'll just be so focused on God, I won't be aware of anybody else. That's not God's plan, never was. Love him and then love others. We reflect God in his image by having a relationship with other people, but it'll be a brother and sister relationship throughout eternity. Now, there's a lot of blessings there, and I hope we can hold on to them. God is a God of relationship. He gave, he made male and female in his image, and he knows that we need relationship, and he's given the gift of marriage. 
Now we can destroy it in our sin. We can do all kinds of things and, and say that we make our own rules. Well, when we fight the creator, we really destroy ourselves and we need to see that. And that's really the second point that we're heading toward. The challenge of relationships. As great as relationships are, they are definitely a challenge. Going to chapter three, I want to go down to verse six. It says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. What we see here is the rejecting of God's plan. God had a rule, one guidance. He said, do not eat of this tree. And, and Eve did. While Adam was watching that whole, that whole dialogue between the serpent and woman, I imagine Adam saw or came up upon it at some point. And he knew. He knew what the right thing to do was. And he could have stopped her. He could have said, wait a minute. We shouldn't have, you shouldn't have done that. And said, Lord, what do we do now? But instead, he chose to be with his wife and follow her. And he ate. And sin came into the world. Rejecting God's plan destroys relationships. If you don't believe me, look at, just look at the relationships that people are putting forth today. Are they, uh, are they a blessing? Or are people angry and frustrated and, and we're tearing each other apart? That's, that's where you see the world today. If we reject God's plan, we destroy relationships. We need to see that. He is the, the, he is the relational one. In himself and with us. Going down to verse 7, uh, verse 7 through 10. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. Rejecting God's plan sends us into hiding. Remember, before God revealed that, that he was there, uh, they, they heard him walking in the garden, whatever that means. They, they knew that they were naked and they covered themselves before one another. They began to hide from one another. And then they certainly began to hide from God. That was one of the major takeaways from the four days of the conference that I went to. We need to open up lines of communication. We need to begin talking about hard issues. We need to come to the place where we can confess and say, what would God say about the things that we're struggling with? He knows the struggles. There's no reason to try to hide it, but we hide it from one another. And in so doing, the, secret, uh, the secrecy of things makes, makes it worse. We need to stop hiding. The, one of the speakers he said about how his grandmother could no longer live by herself and she was from the south, uh, southeast and, and she, she had to move out to Washington state. That's a major change. Well, he, he was trying to be sensitive to his grandmother and he took her out for breakfast and uh, took her out to a meal to a restaurant. And he had three keys that he found that didn't mean you know, they were just representations. And he pushed them to his grandmother and said, these are three conversations I want to have with you to hear your story. And he expected grandma to say, what a wonderful grandson. What a, what a loving thing to do. She had a horrified look on her face. She pushed the keys back. She said, some doors are best left unopened. From a generational perspective, we hide. We've got to learn to stop hiding. Now, that doesn't mean flaunt all of our distorted views of what sexuality is and, and who we think we should be. It's learning to not hide from God and let look at his truth and learning to not hide from one another. That was one of the key things that, that we need to allow people the freedom. And the church is not great at this. You, you can't share those things at church. You'll be rejected. We need to give the message that there is nothing that's in your life that God can't forgive. There's nothing in your life that God can't bless you in, help you with. Um, and again, again, that's offensive. It's, oh, it's, I need to be fixed. I'm not saying that. You just need to, your relationship with God. Let God do the work. But we are going to be loving uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord, and we're going to seek to help you 
and you are accepted here, whatever you're struggling with. Look at uh, chapter three, verse 11. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. <laughs> Rejecting God's plan destroys relationship. Rejecting God's plan sends us into hiding. Rejecting God's plan leads us to blaming. And I put a slash there, attacking. Who did this? She did it. Who did this? The serpent did it. And, and sometimes that blaming is not just kind of a blaming, but it begins an attack. Why do we do that? Because if I can attack you and make you the focus, maybe I don't have to face my stuff. It's a way of hiding. I'll blame someone else and not face my own struggles. Again, we need to be open. We need to know because of God's grace, because of God's grace, we can be open and, and honest about what we're going through. And we can find people in the family of faith to talk to. That doesn't mean I'm going to stand in the pulpit and proclaim all of my issues. I do proclaim some of them and we laugh about some of them. I, those are the ones I'm willing to share. But I find people to talk to and pray with. And, and, and I don't want to blame others when, when I find a good counselor and I say, well, it's there that they call me out on it. <laughs> no, what's going on in your life? Finally, I, I want us to see a number of passages here and just under the heading, rejecting God's plan has consequences. When God spoke to Eve in verse 16, to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Some pretty good, pretty hard consequence, consequences there. She's going to give birth in pain. She's going to desire to have a relationship and he's going to want to rule over you. That doesn't sound pleasant. And that's part of the problem we've had. Men dominating and not realizing the need for the relationship. They just want to have someone they can rule over and control. But to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree, which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Man gets so tied up in his work and the things that he feels like he has to do, he forgets that he has to build that relationship with his wife. He forgets that he must build that relationship with his wife. That's why we have a, a day like Mother's Day. Let's pause and think. That's why the idea of honoring my father and mother is tied in with the Sabbath. We need days to, to slow down and think about what's important. So Adam is going to be cursed with the fact that work is now going to be hard. Then God says, behold, the man has become like one of us, the Trinity, in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God said, sent him out of the garden being to work the guard ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. I love this. This is a consequence. They had to leave the Garden of Eden. But the consequence was actually a gift of grace. If they had laid hold, I, I, I imagine if they would have laid hold of the tree of life, they may, may have gone on living in that sinful state. But God had a better plan. God had a better plan. He didn't want them to continue to live on forever as sinful creatures. Now, I'm including chapter four here uh, to, to look at Chapter four, verse eight, the consequences of, of Adam and Eve's sin devolved rather quickly. It said, Cain spoke to his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Think of how quickly creation went from disobeying God to murder. Now, all sin is sin, but some sins have greater consequences. This sin of the, the fact that one brother killed the other. I, I can't imagine what, how Adam and Eve felt when they realized my son has killed my other son. Just the consequences of that. Um, we need to recognize, you may think if I just hide my problems and I just do my own thing, if y'all just leave me alone, I, I'll be fine. 
I'll, I'm, I'll, I may point at you and I may not be the best at you know, accepting you, but I, I just, just you accept me. But the fact is, if you reject God's plan, there are consequences, eternal consequences, the consequences in your own peace and ability to live life. We need to recognize God's plan has consequences. And that's actually a gift of grace because we just run off and do all kinds of, we're already running off, ignoring the consequences. Those are some challenging things to learn just from these first four chapters, but I don't want to stop with just the fact there's a blessing of relationships and we should uh, try to grow toward it, recognizing there are challenges. Well, how do we do that? And I'll conclude with this statement. Our hope in relationships is found in grace. You know, that's the message of Galatians. So it just seemed fitting that we took some time and just looked at it from a relational standpoint. I want to read a couple verses again and go, in the same chapters, chapters three and four, that tell us of all the challenges of relationships, there are also remedies. There are, there's also reason for hope. This is the way when I was studying the prophet Isaiah, there would be these horrible uh, prophecies about what was to come. And then right along with it, there'd be a message of hope. God always gives us hope. And we need to hang on to that. Genesis 3.15. God said, I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Satan will be crushed. Oh, wait, he's already been crushed. Yes, he's been dealt the death blow, but he's still got some activity. We know in the book of Revelation, the dragon, all the things that, that are yet to be done by Satan. Satan hasn't, isn't completely conquered yet, but he will be fully crushed. But he will strike at Jesus. He did. He struck his heel. The cross was horrible. That's the message of salvation. Because of death coming into the world, Jesus became a man so he could die in our place. And if we believe in him as the only sacrifice for our sin, we can be saved and drawn into a relationship with God. So just our hope in relationships is found in grace, the grace that God, from the very beginning, chapter 3, verse 15, he began to reveal the plan of salvation. The seed of the woman, a descendant from the woman, would crush the serpent's head, Satan's head. Then looking at verse 25 of chapter 4, uh, this is the end of the chapter after Cain and Abel and all of those things. It says, verse 25, I'm saying, chapter 4, verse 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain, for Cain killed him. To, th to Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. Now just think about that for a moment. Um, the father continues to give life physical life. We think about, I, I talk to the parents that are happy that their kids are gone out in, in the world, but they can't wait for their kids to get married and have children so they can be a grandparent. Uh, they don't want that moniker too early in life, but they do look forward to that thought. God continues to give life. And that in, in the midst of all the confusion that we have about sexuality in our world, there's still people being born and God continues to give life. But I don't want to just think about physical life. I want to think about spiritual life. When you think about how fallen this world is, when you think about the things that are just proclaimed that, that stand against God's plan, God still offers salvation. Jesus came to die. And, and wherever you think, well, there's no believers there and there's no evidence the believers are anywhere. God has a remnant of believers everywhere. He has people there to make a difference. And it may not make, uh, it may not be proclaimed on the news and proclaimed on social media, but loving people that are followers of God are making a difference in people's lives and lives are being changed. We need to know that God continues to give life physically and he continues to save souls. We have the gospel of Christ and we need to, to, to proclaim it. And then the last part of verse four, I love, I just needed to end with this verse in the passage that we were looking at. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. God allows us to call upon his name. I'm going to think about it again, uh, the, the presidential proclamation. I want to read one other part of it. It says, we celebrate our incredible good fortune that as Americans, we can exercise our convictions freely. No matter our faiths or beliefs, let us find in our prayers, however, they are delivered, 
the determination to overcome adversity, rise above our differences, and come together as one nation to meet this moment in history. Again, it seems like we are the focus. We're using this thing called prayer, not even sure who we're praying to, but we're using this thing, this thing called prayer to, to motivate us to do our best and make a difference and change this world. It, it just, it was sad when I read the proclamation and I pray for our president as I prayed for all the presidents that, that I've been aware of since I've been born. The fact is we all need the Lord. And our founding fathers would talk about providence, but they were talking about the creator God. We have tried to explain the creation away. That's why I chose the, the first four uh, chapters of Genesis for this message today. To, to, that's the foundation of who we are as a people. So what are we to pray for? How are we to call upon the name of the Lord? First of all, for salvation. We know that the image of God created in man and woman has been marred by sin, but our sins can be forgiven through Jesus Christ. He died and arose. He waits to hear us call upon his name for salvation. Then we also, for sanctification, a big word that says we're willing to be different. We're willing to be set apart. We want to live a different life. I struggle with sin even after salvation, but I have the righteousness of Christ that I lay hold of because I confess my sins. He is faithful and just and forgives me. And I can be different in this world because of that. So I call upon the name for, of the Lord for salvation, for sanctification, and then finally for service. We serve God by sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. We can love others, even our enemies, because that's what Jesus called us to do. And we love them by proclaiming the truth that we know. That truth is offensive. The gospel is an offense. The things that God has in his word as standards are offensive to the world today. We can still lovingly share that truth with other people. They may not take it lovingly, but we still have to do that. And there was one great session from this past week that talked about the things that we say we're not willing to do. Are they really biblical? We need to take a stand in truth, but we need to come with love. Jesus came in love and truth. And what does that love mean? First Peter 4, 8. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. That doesn't mean we, we approve of sin. It doesn't mean that we ignore it. It means that we speak of it in love so that they can find the covering of, of their sins through the, through the love and blood of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of challenges in that. I don't try, try to sum up all the problems that I saw listened to and heard about this past uh, this past week. But the fact is, I want to point us in a direction. Point us to our creator who gives us the blessing of relationships. Point us to our creator who can help us overcome the challenge of relationships. And really remember that we have hope in our relationships because of God's grace. Let me pray. Father, I thank you. Thank you for your love. Your love is real but your love is holy. Your love is, um, a, wants to guide us, but it has a plan that, that, that will come against our desires, our selfish desires. Help us to see you and to love you and then to share that love with other people. Even our, our, those that would say they hate us the most, even our enemies, help us to show love toward them. Father, you can do that. It's because of you that we have the hope in our relationships. And now may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people so that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all of his saints. God bless.